If you're looking to make truly great pizza at home with pretty minimal effort, this video is for you. Because low effort is where pan pizza shines. It doesn't require any complicated shaping or stretching techniques. You basically just throw it into a pan and bake it. Because of that though, it's really easy to make average pan pizza. If you wanna make truly great pizza, there are a few things we need to get right. And over these past few months, as I've been trying to master Detroit style pizza, I've made some pretty big realizations. So the first thing I found that makes a huge difference is something I came across in this book, The Pizza Bible by Tony Gemignani. Gemignani. Tony Gemignani. Anyways, the tip is to use diastatic malt powder in the dough, which is something that I've used before in my non-pan pizza doughs because it helps with the browning of the crust. But since pan pizzas are, well, cooked in a pan, they don't really need that help with browning. However, as I found out during my Philly cheesesteak series, diastatic malt powder does more than just help with browning. It also contains enzymes that help break down the wheat into fermentable sugars, which in turn leads to a stronger, more active fermentation, or in other words, a better rise on your bread. And it allows you to ferment the dough for longer because the yeast has more sugars to feed on. Which leads to my next tip, and that is to use a multi-day cold fermentation. Because even though most of the original Detroit style pizzas use a same day fermentation, and really most of your average pizzerias do the same, it leads to a pretty bland and uninteresting dough. I mean, that's why they're just average pizzerias. A longer fermentation gives the yeast more time to break down the sugars and proteins in the dough, which not only leads to more flavor because of these new compounds being created, but also a much better texture. Since that dough is being broken down further, it ends up a lot more tender and more digestible rather than being chewy and tough. So with these two things alone, I've been able to make a pretty great pan pizza if I do say so myself. But there are still a few things that I need to figure out. The biggest one, which I've sort of always wondered about, is how hydration actually affects the dough and what's the best hydration level to use. Because Buddy's in Detroit, for example, only uses a hydration of about 65%, where I've seen other people use all the way up to 100% or more. Which honestly, at that point, might just be a little bit of a gimmick. But the point is that pan pizzas can handle a pretty high hydration, since they don't need to be shaped super neatly or slid off of a peel or anything like that. You basically just plop them into a pan and they're good to go. So what I wanna do is put this hydration thing to the test. So I made three different doughs, one at 60% hydration, one at 75% hydration, and one at 90% hydration. And they all followed my usual process. So I combined the water, bread flour, diastatic malt powder, yeast, and salt, mix until combined, then knead or perform some stretch and folds about an hour in. The stretch and folds are basically just an alternative to kneading for these higher hydration doughs, since kneading isn't really possible at higher hydrations. But then once the dough has grown by about 50%, I put the doughs into their pans and threw them into the fridge for two days during which time I can make my sauce using the method I came up with in my previous video, which consists of adding about 28 ounces of tomatoes into a pan, along with four grams of salt, one teaspoon of dried oregano, one half teaspoon of dried thyme, three quarters teaspoon of garlic powder, and three quarters teaspoon of red pepper flakes. Then the key is to cook it down until it's reduced by about a quarter to a third, which should take between 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the size of your pan. And the type of pan you use is super important as well. So here, of course, I'm using my favorite stainless steel saute pan, from this video's sponsor, Made In. Made In designs professional quality products for the home cook. And the main reason I love their stainless steel so much for making pizza sauce is because of the pan's five ply construction. Because while stainless steel itself has great heat retention, other materials like aluminum allow for better heat distribution and quicker response to changes in heat. So by layering those materials together, you can take advantage of all the best qualities. These pans are also crafted in Italy and they're made to be super ergonomic and well balanced, which makes for easy flipping of ingredients. Because some of you may know that I recently started working at one of my local pizzerias and I'm always amazed when I cook at home now at just how much easier and more comfortable these pans are than the generic ones we use at the restaurant. Plus the rolled rim allows you to pour things out of them without spilling which prevents a lot of frustration. So you can check out Made In's stainless steel collection along with their other cookware by using the link in my description below. Thanks again to Made In for sponsoring this video and thank you for your support. Now let's finish making this pizza. Alright so these results here are very interesting. Definitely not quite what I was expecting. Because just like an atom, you can see a pretty big difference between all three. When they were baking, the 75 and 90% hydrations looked really good. They were bubbling up super nicely. But as you can see now, once they've started to cool, we've kind of got these weird valleys here where the sauce was striped on. I guess because the dough just wasn't really strong enough to hold up to the weight of it. Now, I do think I have a few ideas for how to fix that without having to reduce the hydration, but we'll get into that in a minute. So again, all these use the exact same amount of dough, same amount of cheese, same amount of sauce, and structure 
structure wise, we can see the 60% has a pretty nice rigid structure to it. 75% a little bit floppier, but still pretty rigid, where the 90% is pretty floppy, at least for a Detroit style pizza. So let's cut into these and see what we're working with. So for me, there's definitely a clear winner here, but it definitely needs a little bit of refining. So I'll say the 60% here, I mean, it's a really good pizza, pretty much what you'd expect from a traditional Detroit style pizza, like what you get at Buddy's. But to me, it's not really the ultimate pan pizza dough. It's just a little bit more dense than I personally like, and nothing really stands out too much about the dough itself. Now on the other end of the spectrum with this 90% dough, I mean, I do really like the super sort of extreme airiness to it, but it's also pretty floppy and just didn't have that same level of crisp that we got the 60%. Obviously, I could probably bake it a little bit longer and that would fix some of those issues. But you could also see that that middle part where the sauce was pretty much completely flattened out. And although I think we can build a little bit more structure into this dough, I don't think that going this high in the hydration is really necessary. Instead, I think this 75% here is the clear winner. It's a pretty nice middle ground between the 60 and the 90% because you still get that super nice airiness. And actually, because it is lighter and airier, it rose a bit higher. And so we could probably even use less dough to still reach the proper height for a Detroit style pizza. But first, there's another pretty big issue with this pizza that I've been trying to solve throughout this whole series, and I think I finally know what to do. So this is the pan that I've been using so far. It's from a brand called Lloyd Pans, and it's pretty much what everybody who makes Detroit style pizza these days uses. That is, except for the actual original Detroit style pizzerias. Because we talked about before, they use blue steel pans, which were the pans originally used in the auto industry. I mean, that's how the style of pizza came about in the first place. And that's what I thought this Lloyd pan was, but as a few people pointed out in the comments of my previous videos, this one is actually made out of aluminum, not steel. And as we talked about earlier in this video, aluminum is a very good conductor of heat, which means it heats up really quickly. And so I think that's what's been causing the edges of my pizzas to burn. I mean, if we look at the ones that I've been baking side by side with what I tried back in Detroit, it's a pretty night and day difference. Those ones had a really nice crispy edge without being burnt, which is something that I've really been struggling to achieve. But I'm hoping that this here is gonna be the solution because this is an actual blue steel pan, which again, I was able to find with help from some commenters. I actually got it from a site called DetroitStylePizza.com, who would have thought? And I was kind of skeptical to buy from them to begin with, but you can see, I mean, it looks really nice. Actually came really quickly, so I'm super excited to give it a try side by side with my aluminum pan. So I started off this dough the same way as before using my 75% hydration recipe, but I'm also trying to fix that dough strength issue I had with the last batch, and I think the fix for that is mostly just gonna come down to the dough making process. So rather than performing one set of stretch and folds before throwing the dough into the pan, I performed several sets, about one every 20 minutes until the dough was nice and strong and had grown in size by about 50%. So in total, I ended up doing four sets. But that's not all, because rather than just plopping the dough into the pans, I also made sure to ball it up nice and tight before panning it and tossing it into the fridge. And about 24 hours later, I also took it out of the pan and re-balled it just to make sure that it was extra strong. And at this point, I could have left them out at room temperature to bake today, but I wanted to do an even longer fermentation for the reasons we talked about earlier. So I threw them in the fridge for another 48 hours, at which point I took them out, stretched the dough to the edges of the pan, let it rise again, topped it, and baked it. And this is what we've come up with. Let's get straight into it. Moment of truth. Let's see what these edges look like. Pretty charred on the edges. I did bake these for a little bit longer in an attempt to reduce that sort of caving effect, but you can see we are still getting a little bit of that caving. So we'll talk more about that in a minute, but let's check out the steel baked pizza. Definitely a lot more stuck to the edges. Being that it's a steel pan, it does need to be seasoned. So looking at these two side by side, I mean, honestly, they're pretty much indistinguishable. For some reason, they both have this one really charred side. So really just visually, I'm not seeing a big difference between the steel versus the aluminum. The visuals only tell one part of the story. So let's see how they taste. Yeah, I mean, honestly, flavor and texture wise, there's really no noticeable difference between these two. I'm kind of surprised about that. I thought the steel was gonna be a lot better just because it takes longer to heat up. But if anything, the aluminum actually ended up a little bit crispier without really being any more burnt. Obviously they both are burnt, so that's still something that I need to figure out. But in terms of the pan for Detroit style pizza, I really don't see any reason to go out of your way to get the steel when the aluminum is a lot more readily available. However, I did try out a couple other options here. The first is 
actually with my stainless steel. And surprisingly, it kind of looks better than the other two. I mean, it's got those really nice crisp edges without being burnt. I will say the edges had a little bit of a different texture to them. I would say they're maybe more like crunchy than crisp, just a little bit harder to chew through, but definitely very solid. And I mean, the flavor of them wasn't charred and burnt like with the other pans. So if you do have a high quality stainless steel pan, I think this is a pretty decent one to use to make a pan pizza. Now we do also have one other challenger here. That is this glass nine by 13 pan, just cause I figured it's one that most people probably already have. And you can see, I mean, it actually looks really solid. I would say perfect level of browning on the sides. I probably could have used a little bit more cheese here. I just sort of eyeballed it since this is a different size pan than I usually use. Pretty solid structure to it. So again, another really good pizza. I would say it does have more of that sort of crunchy effect rather than the crispness that you get from the steel or aluminum. But really the main limiting factor with this pizza was just that you can only bake at 425 maximum with a glass pan. So I baked this for a little longer than usual, but it actually seemed to turn out fine. That lower temperature might actually be a good thing. It's definitely something I'm gonna test out as I'm trying to fix those overcharred edges. Because I'm starting to wonder if this is really due to the pan material or if it was more due to the baking temperature. But before we get there, we need to talk about the dough structure, because if you remember, that was the other main thing I was testing here. And if we look back at my slices that were cooked in the Detroit style pizza pans, I mean, you can see there's a little bit of caving on them, but not nearly as bad as in the last test. And actually, these turned out super light and airy. I mean, I've never had a crumb structure this nice on a Detroit style pizza. And looking back at my stainless steel pan pizza, which I did accidentally make a little bit thinner, I didn't get almost any caving. And I think most of that is due to the fact that it was just so much thinner. So rather than trying to decrease the hydration, I think I'm gonna give that a try, along with a few other things, which I'm hoping are gonna also help me to fix that charring issue on the crust. So let's make some pizza and give this thing one final test. So I've got my pizzas number one and two here. You can already see they look quite a bit better than the previous ones. I still have two more in the oven, which I'm hoping will fix the rest of my issues. But for now, let's take a look at these. With this pizza on the right here, I've pretty much completely fixed that caving in issue. So I tried a bunch of things here. You can see I made the dough a little bit thinner. I also did a longer cold fermentation in the fridge to try to build extra strength in the dough. But none of that stuff seemed to make a huge difference. What really made the difference was simply just putting the sauce on after the pizza was already baked. That's what I did here, and you can see, I mean, it completely fixed that caving in issue. And it looks like I put a ton of sauce on this, but it's actually less than I put on this one. I guess because it doesn't evaporate and sort of cook off during baking, you could probably get away with using a little bit less sauce. Now you can see though, I didn't quite fix that issue with the charring on the edges. That's something that I'm hoping this next test is gonna accomplish. But for now, let's give these two a try. So I'm actually pretty surprised that flavor-wise, there's not a huge difference. I mean, you can tell that the sauce that was cooked in the oven is a little bit more concentrated, but it's not nearly as big of a difference as I thought it'd be. The main difference though, of course, is in the texture of the dough. I mean, they're both great. I really like the kind of airiness that you get from this one, but if we're trying to make an authentic Detroit style pizza, this one just hits the mark so much more. It's pretty amazing how big of a difference the texture actually makes. I thought it'd be more of a visual thing with that caving in, but just having that more uniform crumb, I mean, it makes it feel like a completely different type of pizza. And actually, I think given how good these results are, we could easily push the hydration quite a bit higher. So I'm definitely gonna play around with that before I come out with my final recipe. The one thing I'm still struggling with though is not burning that edge. But I'm hoping this pizza in the oven is gonna be the solution I'm looking for. So let's see if it's ready. All right, so just talking in terms of the cheese edge, this is definitely the least charred one I've made yet. Basically what I did here with these first pizzas, I baked them at 550 degrees for just about 10 minutes minutes. Whereas these I baked at 400 degrees and it took about 18 minutes for them to get fully cooked through. And again, I did one with the sauce before baking and one after. 
All right, so now I'm seeing why these edges looked a little bit better. The exterior of this pizza overall just got a lot less well done. I mean, if you look at the bottom, it's almost no color, and as soon as you bite into it, there's pretty much no crispness either. I thought that by cooking at a lower temperature, it would allow the inside to cook fully before the outside gets too charred and burnt, but I think that going all the way down to 400 degrees was taking it a little bit too far. If we look at that in comparison to my 550 degree pizza, I mean, it's a pretty big difference. And this one was baked for almost half the time. You can also see the 550 pizza has a lot better structure to it and it also got a better oven spring as well. So I do think that baking higher is the way to go. But what I need to do with this one is either bake it for less time or maybe reduce the temperature just slightly. I'll have to do a little bit of experimentation but my main concern is just that I don't want the middle to be undercooked. So I'll update the video description with what I come up with as my final method and you can click right here to see my final ultimate Detroit style pizza recipe where I put everything together once that video is uploaded. In the meantime, in the meantime, you can check out this video right here to see how I made my ultimate Detroit style pizza sauce. And I also break down a little bit of how to make a better pizza sauce in general. So either way, thanks a lot for watching and I'll talk to you in the next one.